Lena St. Clair, The Voice from the Wall When I was little, my mother told me my great-grandfather had sentenced a beggar to die in the worst possible way, and that later the dead man came back and killed my great-grandfather. Either that or he died of influenza one week later. I used to play out the beggar's last moments over and over again in my head. In my mind, I saw the executioner strip off the man's shirt and lead him into the open yard. This traitor, read the executioner, is sentenced to die the death of a thousand cuts. But before he could even raise the sharp sword to whittle his life away, they found the beggar's mind had already broken into a thousand pieces. A few days later, my great-grandfather looked up from his books and saw the same man looking like a smashed vase hastily put back together. As the sword was cutting me down, said the ghost, I thought this was the worst I would ever have to endure. But I was wrong. The worst is on the other side. And the dead man embraced my great-grandfather with the jagged pieces of his arm and pulled him through the wall to show him what he meant. I once asked my mother how he really died. She said, In bed, very quickly, after being sick for only two days. No, no, I mean the other man. How was he killed? Did they slice off his skin first? Did they use a cleaver to chop up his bones? Did he scream and feel all 1,000 cuts? Ay, why do you Americans have only these morbid thoughts in your mind? Cried my mother in Chinese. That man has been dead for almost 70 years. What does it matter how he died? I always thought it mattered to know what is the worst possible thing that can happen to you. To know how you can avoid it to not be drawn by the magic of the unspeakable. Because even as a young child, I could sense the unspoken terrors that surrounded our house, the ones that chased my mother until she hid in a secret dark corner of her mind, and still they found her. I watched over the years as they devoured her piece by piece until she disappeared and became a ghost. As I remember it, the dark side of my mother sprang from the basement in our old house in Oakland. I was five, and my mother tried to hide it from me. She barricaded the door with a wooden chair, secured it with a chain and two types of key locks. And it became so mysterious that I spent all my energies unraveling this door, until the day I was finally able to pry it open with my small fingers, only to immediately fall headlong into the dark chasm. And it was only after I stopped screaming, I had seen the blood of my nose on my mother's shoulder. Only then did my mother tell me about the bad man who lived in the basement and why I should never open the door again. He had lived there for thousands of years, she said, and was so evil and hungry that had my mother not rescued me so quickly, this bad man would have planted five babies in me and then eaten us all in a six-course meal, tossing our bones on the dirty floor. And after that, I began to see terrible things. I saw these things with my Chinese eyes, the part of me I got from my mother. I saw devils dancing feverishly beneath a hole I had dug in the sandbox. I saw that lightning had eyes and searched to strike down little children. I saw a beetle wearing the face of a child, which I promptly squashed with the wheel of my tricycle. And when I became older, I could see things that Caucasian girls had scolded not, monkey rings that would split in two and send a swinging child hurtling through space, tether balls that could splash a girl's head all over the playground in front of laughing friends. I didn't tell anyone about the things I saw, not even my mother. Most people didn't know I was half Chinese, maybe because my last name is St. Clair. When people first saw me, they thought I looked like my father, English-Irish, big-boned and delicate at the same time. But if they looked really close, if they knew that they were there, they could see the Chinese parts. Instead of having cheeks like my father's sharp-edged points, mine were smooth as beach pebbles. I didn't have his straw-yellow hair or his white skin. Yet my coloring looked too pale, like something that was once darker and had faded in the sun. And my eyes, my mother gave me my eyes, <laughs> no eyelids as if they were carved on a jack-o'-lantern with two swift cuts of a short knife. I used to push my eyes in on the sides to make them rounder, or I'd open them very wide until I could see the white parts. But when I walked around the house like that, my father asked me why I looked so scared. I have a photo of my mother with the same scared look. My father said the picture was taken when Ma was first released from Angel Island Immigration Station. She stayed there for three weeks, until they could process her papers and determine whether she was a war bride, a displaced person, a student, or the wife of a Chinese-American citizen. My father said they didn't have rules for dealing with the Chinese wife of a Caucasian citizen. Somehow, in the end, 
They declared her a displaced person, lost in a sea of immigration categories. My mother never talked about her life in China, but my father said he saved her from a terrible life there, some tragedy she could not speak about. My father proudly named her in her immigration papers, Betty St. Clair, crossing out her given name of Gu Yingying. And then he put down the wrong birth year, 1916 instead of 1914. So, with the sweep of a pen, my mother lost her name and became a dragon instead of a tiger. In this picture, you can see why my mother looks displaced. She is clutching a large clam-shaped bag, as though someone might steal this from her as well if she's less watchful. She has on an ankle-length Chinese dress with modest vents at the side. And on top, she's wearing a westernized suit jacket, awkwardly stylish on my mother's small body, with its padded shoulders, white labels, and oversized cloth buttons. This was my mother's wedding dress, a gift from my father. In this outfit, she looks as if she were neither coming from nor going to someplace. Her chin is bent down and you can see the precise part in her hair, a neat white line drawn from above her left brow, then over the black horizon of her head. And even though her head is bowed, humble in defeat, her eyes are staring up past the camera, wide open. Why does she look scared, I asked my father. And my father explained. It was only because he said, cheese. And my mother was struggling to keep her eyes open until the flash went off ten seconds later. My mother often looked this way, waiting for something to happen, wearing this scared look. Only later, she lost the struggle to keep her eyes open. Don't look at her, said my mother as we walked through Chinatown in Oakland. She had grabbed my hand and pulled me close to her body. And of course I looked. I saw a woman sitting on the sidewalk, leaning against a building. She was old and young at the same time, with dull eyes as though she had not slept for many years. And her feet and her hands, the tips were as black as if she had dipped them in India ink. But I knew they were rotted. What did she do to herself? I whispered to my mother. She met a bad man, said my mother. She had a baby she didn't want. And I knew that was not true. I knew my mother made up anything to warn me, to help me avoid some unknown danger. My mother saw danger in everything, even in other Chinese people. Where we lived and shopped, everyone spoke Cantonese or English. My mother was from Wuxi, near Shanghai. So she spoke Mandarin and a little bit of English. My father, who spoke only a few canned Chinese expressions, insisted my mother learn English. So with him, she spoke in moods and gestures, looks and silences, and sometimes a combination of English punctuated by hesitations and Chinese frustration. Words cannot come out. So my father would put words in her mouth. I think mom is trying to say she's tired, he would whisper when my mother became moody. I think she's saying we're the best darn family in the country, he'd exclaim when she had cooked a wonderfully fragrant meal. But with me, when we were alone, my mother would speak in Chinese, saying things my father could not possibly imagine. I could understand the words perfectly, but not the meanings. One thought led to another without connection. You must not walk in any direction, but to school and back home, warned my mother when she decided I was old enough to walk by myself. Why, I asked. You can't understand these things, she said. Why not? Because I haven't put it in your mind yet. Why not? Hey, such questions. Because it is too terrible to consider. A man can grab you off the streets, sell you to someone else, make you have a baby. Then you kill the baby. And when they find this baby in the garbage can, then what can be done? You go to jail, die there. I knew this was not a true answer. But I also made up lies to prevent bad things from happening in the future. I often lied when I had to translate for her the endless forms, instructions, notices from school, telephone calls. What meaning? She asked me when the man at a grocery store yelled at her for opening up jars to smell the insides. I was so embarrassed. I told her that Chinese people were not allowed to shop there. When the school sent a notice home about a polio vaccination, I told her the time and place and added that all students were now required to use metal lunchboxes since they had discovered old paper bags can carry polio germs. We're moving up in the world, my father proudly announced, this being the occasion of his promotion to sales supervisor of a clothing manufacturer. Your mother is thrilled. And we did move up, across the bay to San Francisco and up a hill in North Beach, to an Italian neighborhood 
where the sidewalk was so steep I had to lean into the slant to get home from school each day. I was ten, and I was hopeful that we might be able to leave all the old fears behind in Oakland. The apartment building was three stories high, two apartments per floor. It had a renovated facade, a recent layer of white stucco, topped with connected rows of metal fire escape ladders. But inside it was old. The front door with its narrow glass panes opened into a musty lobby that smelled of everybody's life mixed together. Everybody meant the names on the front door next to their little buzzers. Anderson, Giordino, Heyman, Ricci, Sorsi, in our name, St. Clair. We lived on the middle floor, stuck between cooking smells that floated up and feet sounds that drifted down. My bedroom faced the street, and at night, in the dark, I could see in my mind another life. Cars struggling to climb the steep, fog-shrouded hill, gunning their deep engines and spinning their wheels. Loud, happy people laughing, puffing, gasping. Are we almost there? A beagle scrambling to his feet to start his yipping yowl, answered a few seconds later by fire truck sirens and an angry woman hissing. Sammy, bear the dog, hush now! And with all the soothing predictability, I would soon fall asleep. My mother was not happy with the apartment, but I didn't see that at first. When we moved in, she busied herself with getting settled, arranging the furniture and packing dishes, hanging pictures on the wall. It took her about one week. And soon after that, when she and I were walking to the bus stop, she met a man who threw her off balance. He was a red-faced Chinese man, wobbling down the sidewalk as if he were lost. His runny eyes saw us, and he quickly stood up straight and threw out his arms, shouting, I found you, Susie Wong, girl of my dreams, ha! And with his arms and mouth wide open, he started rushing toward us. My mother dropped my hand and covered her body with her arms as if she were naked, unable to do anything else. In that moment, as she let go, I started to scream, seeing this dangerous man lunging closer. I was still screaming after two laughing men grabbed this man and, shaking him, said, Joe, stop it for Christ's sake. You're scaring that poor little girl and her maid. The rest of the day, while riding on the bus, walking in and out of stores, shopping for our dinner, my mother trembled. She clutched my hand so tightly it hurt. And once, when she let go of my hand to take her wallet out of her purse at the cash register, I started to slip away to look at the candy. She grabbed my hand back so fast, I knew at that instant how sorry she was that she had not protected me better. As soon as we got home from grocery shopping, she began to put the cans and vegetables away. And then, as if something were not quite right, she removed the cans from one shelf and switched them with the cans on another. Next, she walked briskly into the living room, and moved a large round mirror from the wall facing the front door to a wall by the sofa. What are you doing, I asked. She whispered something in Chinese about things not being balanced, and I thought she meant how things looked, not how things felt. And then she started to move the larger pieces, the sofa, chairs, end tables, a Chinese scroll of goldfish. What's going on here? Asked my father when he came home from work. She's making it look better, I said. And the next day, when I came home from school, I saw she had again rearranged everything. Everything was in a different place. I could see that some terrible danger lay ahead. Why are you doing this? I asked her, afraid she would give me a true answer. But she whispered some Chinese nonsense instead. When something goes against your nature, you are not in balance. This house was built too steep, and a bad wind from the top blows all your strength back down the hill so you can never get a hit. You are always rolling backward. And then she started pointing to the walls and doors of the apartment. See how narrow this doorway is? Like a neck that has been strangled. And the kitchen faces this toilet room, so all your worth is flushed away. But what does it mean? What's going to happen if it's not balanced? I asked my mother. My father explained it to me later. Your mother is just practicing her nesting instincts. He said, all mothers get it. You'll see when you're older. I wonder why my father never worried. Was he blind? Why did my mother and I see something more? And then a few days later, I found out that my father had been right all along. I came home from school, walked into my bedroom, and saw it. My mother had rearranged my room. My bed was no longer by the window, but against a wall. And where my bed once was, now there stood a used crib. So the secret danger was a ballooning stomach, the source of my mother's imbalance. My mother was going to have a baby. See? 
said my father as we both looked at the crib. Nesting instincts. Here's the nest, and here's where the baby goes. He was so pleased with this imaginary baby in the crib, he didn't see what I later saw. My mother began to bump into things, into table edges, as if she forgot her stomach contained a baby, as if she were headed for trouble instead. She did not speak of the joys of having a new baby. She talked about a heaviness around her, about things being out of balance, not in harmony with one another. So I worried about that baby, that it was stuck somewhere between my mother's stomach and this crib in my room. With my bed against the wall, the nighttime life of my imagination changed. Instead of street sounds, I began to hear voices coming from the wall, from the apartment next door. The front door buzzer said a family called the Sorcies lived there. That first night, I heard the muffled sound of someone shouting, A woman? A girl? I flattened my ear against the wall and heard a woman's angry voice, then another, the higher voice of a girl shouting back. And now the voices turned toward me, like fire sirens turning onto our street, and I could hear the accusations fading in and out. Who am I to say? Why do you keep bugging me? Then get out and stay out. Rather die than rather be dead. Why don't you then? Then I heard scraping sounds, slamming, pushing, and shouts, and then whack, whack, whack. Someone was killing. Someone was being killed. Screams and shouts. A mother had a sword high above a girl's head and was starting to slice her life away. First a braid, then her scalp, an eyebrow, a toe, a thumb, the point of her cheek, the slant of her nose, until there was nothing left, no sounds. I lay back against my pillow my heart pounding at what I had just witnessed with my ears and my imagination. A girl had just been killed. I hadn't been able to stop myself from listening. I wasn't able to stop what happened. The horror of it all. But the next night, the girl came back to life with more screams, more beating, her life once more in peril. And so it continued, night after night, a voice pressing against my wall, telling me that this was the worst possible thing that could happen. The terror of not knowing when it would ever stop. Sometimes I heard this loud family across the hallway that separated our two apartment doors. Their apartment was by the stairs going up to the third floor. Ours was by the stairs going down to the lobby. You break your leg sliding down the banister. I'm going to break your neck, a woman shouted. Her warnings were followed by the sounds of feet stomping on the stairs. Don't forget to pick up pop suits. I knew their terrible life so intimately that I was startled by the immediacy of seeing her in person for the first time. I was pulling the front door shut while balancing an armload of books. And when I turned around, I saw her coming toward me just a few feet away, and I shrieked and dropped everything. She snickered, and I knew who she was. This tall girl whom I guessed to be about 12, two years older than I was. Then she bolted down the stairs, and I quickly gathered up my books and followed her, careful to walk on the other side of the street. She didn't seem like a girl who had been killed a hundred times. I saw no traces of bloodstained clothes. She wore a crisp white blouse, a blue cardigan sweater, and a blue-green pleated skirt. In fact, as I watched her, she seemed quite happy, her two brown braids bouncing jauntily in rhythm to her walk. And then, as if she knew that I was thinking about her, she turned her head. She gave me a scowl and quickly ducked down a side street and walked out of my sight. Every time I saw her after that, I would pretend to look down busy rearranging my books or the buttons on my sweater, guilty that I knew everything about her. My parents' friends, Auntie Sue and Uncle Canning, picked me up at school one day and took me to the hospital to see my mother. I knew this was serious because everything they said was unnecessary but spoken with solemn importance. It is now four o'clock, said Uncle Canning, looking at his watch. The bus is never on time, said Auntie Sue. When I visited my mother in the hospital, she seemed half asleep, tossing back and forth, and then her eyes popped open, staring at the ceiling. My fault, my fault. I knew this before it happened, she babbled. I did nothing to prevent it. Betty, darling, Betty, darling, said my father frantically. But my mother kept shouting these accusations to herself. She grabbed my hand and I realized her whole body was shaking. And then she looked at me in a strange way as if she were begging me for her life, as if I could pardon her. She was mumbling in Chinese. Lena, what's she saying? cried my father. For once, he had no words to put in my mother's mouth. And for once, I had no ready answer. It struck me that the worst possible thing had happened, that what she had been fearing had come true. They were no longer warnings, and so I listened. 
when the baby was ready to be born, she murmured. I could already hear him screaming inside my womb. His little fingers, they were clinging to stay inside. But the nurses, the doctors, they said to push him out, make him come. And when his head popped out, the nurses cried, his eyes are wide open, he sees everything. Then his body slipped out and he lay on the table, steaming with life. When I looked at him, I saw right away, his tiny legs, his small arms, his thin neck, and then a large head, so terrible I could not stop looking at it. This baby's eyes were open, and his head, it was open too. I could see all the way back to where his thoughts were supposed to be and there was nothing there. No brain, the doctor shouted. His head is just an empty eggshell. And then this baby, maybe he heard us. His large head seemed to fill with hot air and rise up from the table. The head turned to one side, then to the other. It looked right through me. I knew he could see everything inside me, how I had given no thought to killing my other son. How I had given no thought to having this baby. I could not tell my father what she had said. He was so sad already with this empty crib in his mind. How could I tell him she was crazy? So this is what I translated for him. She says we must all think very hard about having another baby. She says she hopes this baby is very happy on the other side. And she thinks we should leave now and go have dinner. After the baby died, my mother fell apart. Not all at once, but piece by piece, like plates falling off a shelf one by one. I never knew when it would happen, so I became nervous all the time, waiting. Sometimes she would start to make dinner, but would stop halfway, the water running full steam in the sink, her knife poised in the air over half-chopped vegetables, silent, tears flowing. And sometimes we'd be eating and we would have to stop and put our forks down because she had dropped her face into her hands and was saying, Make one she, it doesn't matter. My father would just sit there, trying to figure out what it was that didn't matter this much. And I would leave the table, knowing it would happen again, always the next time. My father seemed to fall apart in a different way. He tried to make things better, but it was as if he were running to catch things before they fell. Only he would fall before he could catch anything. She's just tired, he explained to me when we were eating dinner at the Gold Spike, just the two of us, because my mother was lying like a statue in her bed. I knew he was thinking about her because he had this worried face, staring at his dinner plate as if it were filled with worms instead of spaghetti. At home, my mother looked at everything around her with empty eyes. My father would come home from work, patting my head, saying, How's my big girl? But always looking past me toward my mother. I had such fears inside, not in my head, but in my stomach. I could no longer see what was so scary, but I could feel it. I could feel every little movement in our silent house, and at night, I could feel the crashing loud fights on the other side of my bedroom wall, this girl being beaten to death. In bed, with the blanket edge lying across my neck, I used to wonder which was worse, our side or theirs. And after thinking about this for a while, after feeling sorry for myself, it comforted me somewhat to think about this girl next door had a more unhappy life. But one night after dinner, our doorbell rang. This was curious because usually people rang the buzzer downstairs first. Lena, could you see who it is? Called my father from the kitchen. He was doing the dishes. My mother was lying in bed. My mother was now always resting and it was as if she had died and became a living ghost. I opened the door cautiously, then swung it wide open with surprise. It was the girl from next door. I stared at her with undisguised amazement. She was smiling back at me and she looked ruffled as if she had fallen out of bed with her clothes on. Who is it? Called my father. It's next door, I shouted to my father. It's Teresa, she offered quickly. It's Teresa, I yelled back to my father. Invite her in, my father said at almost the same moment that Teresa squeezed past me and into our apartment. Without being invited, she started walking toward my bedroom. I closed the front door and followed her two brown braids that were bouncing like whips beating the back of a horse. She walked right over to my window and began to open it. What are you doing? I cried. She sat on the window ledge, looked out on the street, and then she looked at me and started to giggle. I sat down on my bed watching her, waiting for her to stop, feeling the cold air blow in from the dark opening. What's so funny, I finally said. It occurred to me that perhaps she was laughing at me, at my life. Maybe she had listened through the wall and heard nothing, the stagnant silence of our unhappy house. 
Why are you laughing? I demanded. My mother kicked me out, she finally said. She talked with a swagger, seeming to be proud of this fact. And then she snickered a little and said, We had this fight, and she pushed me out the door and locked it. So now she thinks I'm going to wait outside the door until I'm sorry and out to apologize. But I'm not going to. Then what are you going to do? I asked breathlessly, certain that her mother would kill her for good this time. I'm going to use your fire escape to climb back into my bedroom, she whispered back. And she's going to wait. And when she gets worried, she'll open the front door. Only I won't be there. I'll be in my bedroom. In bed. She giggled again. Won't she be mad when she finds you? Nah. <laughs> she'll just be glad I'm not dead or something. Oh, she'll pretend to be mad, sort of. We do this kind of stuff all the time. And then she slipped through my window and soundlessly made her way back home. I stared at the open window for a long time, wondering about her. How could she go back? Didn't she see how terrible her life was? Didn't she recognize it would never stop? I lay down on my bed, waiting to hear the screams and shouts. And late at night, I was still awake when I heard the loud voices next door. Mrs. Sorcy was shouting and crying, You stupid a girl! You almost gave me a heart attack! And Teresa was yelling back, I could have been killed. I almost fell and broke my neck. And then I heard them laughing and crying, crying and laughing, shouting with love. I was stunned. I could almost see them hugging and kissing one another. I was crying for joy with them because I had been wrong. And in my memory, I can still feel the hope that beat in me that night. I clung to this hope day after day, night after night, year after year. I would watch my mother lying in her bed, babbling to herself as she sat on the sofa. And yet I knew that this, the worst possible thing, would one day stop. I still saw bad things in my mind, but now I found ways to change them. I still heard Mrs. Sorcy and Teresa having terrible fights. But I saw something else. I saw a girl complaining that the pain of not being seen was unbearable. I saw the mother lying in bed in her long, flowing robes. Then the girl pulled out a sharp sword and told her mother, Then you must die to death of a thousand cuts. It is the only way to save you. The mother accepted this and closed her eyes. The sword came down and sliced back and forth, up and down, wish, wish, wish. And the mother screamed and shouted, cried out in terror and pain. But when she opened her eyes, she saw no blood, no shredded flesh. The girl said, Do you see now? The mother nodded. Now I have perfect understanding. I have already experienced the worst. After this, there is no worst possible thing. And the daughter said, Now you must come back to the other side. Then you can see why you were wrong. And the girl grabbed her mother's hand and pulled her through the wall.